from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. So I ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Last week, I asked the First Minister three times whether her government had contacted the European Commission to seek an extension to the deadline on farm payments. And three times, she refused to answer. We now know that her government had contacted the Commission to do so, and we also know that the First Minister was aware of that. So can I ask, why did she try to hide it when she came before Parliament last Thursday? First Minister. Well, what of course I said in the Chamber last Thursday is that we continued to discuss contingencies with the European Commission. That is what a request for an extension is, a contingency that we are seeking to put in place. But I don't want, I don't want anyone, particularly those working in delivering this system, to think that we are in any way relying on getting an extension so that we take our foot off the pedal in any way in actually delivering these payments. That's why last week and again this week, what I will stress is what we are doing to deliver these Pillar 1 payments by the deadline, which is midnight tomorrow. So let me just give the Chamber an update on that work. Rapid progress has been made on a daily basis. To put that into context, uh, two weeks ago on the 16th of June, 58% uh, of payments by value had been made. By last Friday, that had risen to 76%. This morning, it was 82%. That means £347 million of the Pillar 1 payments have already been made. Uh, and the last point I would make, presiding officer, is this, because this is actually what matters to farmers and to crofters across the country. Uh, all farmers eligible were offered a loan. And the vast majority of farmers took up the offer of a loan payment so that they received 80% of the amount that they were due last November, pending payment of their full payment. So this is not a case of farmers not getting the money that they are due. So this government will continue to do just as I said we would do last week, which is continue to make sure that these payments are made and farmers get the support that they deserve. Ruth Davidson. I think we've all just heard what the Chamber made of that answer. And, Presiding Officer, there is a reason why I'm raising this again today. And it's because there is a principle at stake about the conduct of ministers in this Parliament and about the transparency of this government. Because I asked the First Minister... Presiding officer, I asked the First Minister a simple question in this chamber last week, yeah. and she refused to tell this Parliament what she knew to be the truth. Yes. So let me read out what the Ministerial Code of Conduct is to the First Minister. It says, it is of paramount importance that ministers give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunity. Accurate and truthful. Does she think that her conduct and the conduct of her ministers on this matter in the last two weeks has met that standard? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, last week, I said that we were discussing with the European Commission contingencies around this issue. That is exactly what we were doing. It is what we continue to do. Seeking an extension in case we require that extension is exactly that, a contingency. But what I stressed last week is exactly what I will stress this week. And with the greatest respect to Ruth Davidson, this is what farmers the length and the breadth of the country are actually interested in. We are working flat out to deliver these payments. I notice uh, Ruth Davidson didn't comment on the substance of this issue, which is that we are seeing rapid daily progress in getting these payments made, firstly. And secondly, uh, we have put in place, and we put this in place in November last year, a system of loans for farmers, so that those who are eligible for Pillar 1 payments actually got 80% of all the money they were due. And that is something we did 
at the specific request, of course, of the National Farmers Union. So we will continue to deal with the substance of this issue, make sure that farmers get the money that they deserve. So we'll get on with the job where we leave Ruth Davidson to continue playing politics. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, myself and my party have been pursuing this government's failures on the substance of this issue for three years and they're still not making the payments on time. But here's what the First Minister apparently thinks is accurate and truthful conduct. On Tuesday of last week, Fergus Ewing told the SNP Cabinet in private that he would be applying to the European Commission for an extension to the deadline on farm payments. On Wednesday, he wrote in private to the European Commission to seek it. Then that afternoon he was asked in Parliament to confirm whether that was the case and he failed to do so. Then on Thursday I stood here and repeatedly asked the First Minister to confirm it and she refused to answer the question. And it took journalists to email the European Commission itself for the facts to come out. Last week the First Minister had to apologise to farmers over messing up their payments again, that was the substance of this, but now she owes the Parliament an apology for not being straight about it. Will she give it? Will she give it? First Minister. Well, look, I made clear in the Parliament last week that we were discussing contingencies with the European Commission. That's what we were doing last week. It is what we continue to do this week. That is what seeking an extension is. We hope we don't require to use it, but it is a contingency in case we do. But the most important thing uh, and the most important message I wanted to send last week and the same message I want to send this week is this one. Uh, we are working flat out to get the payments yeah. into the Absolutely. bank accounts of farmers and we are seeing progress being made in that with, uh, on a, a daily basis up to the deadline uh, which is midnight tomorrow. And of course the point that Ruth Davidson never uh, wants to recognise is the point I've now made twice about loan payments to farmers. We took action to make sure that farmers, notwithstanding the difficulties we have encountered uh, with this system, are actually getting the vast bulk of the money that they are due. That is the kind of action that I think farmers expect to see, and it's the kind of action people across Scotland expect to see from this uh, government. Now, Ruth Davidson mentioned apologies. I think there is an apology due uh, to the people of Scotland this week, and it's an apology due from Ruth Davidson for allowing her MPs in Westminster to do two things. Firstly, presiding officer, allowing them to sit back while Scotland was denied the same extra funding that went to Northern Ireland. And secondly, an apology for being the MPs in the House of Commons last night that voted to block a pay rise for public sector workers. Perhaps that's the apology people in Scotland want to see. Ruth Davidson. Oh. I think recess can't come soon enough for this First Minister. Uh, what we've just seen there is a First Minister whose first response to failure is to try and hide it and then to stand up here and ask for applause when she tries to fix her own mess. Well, what we've seen this week is a response, which a message to voters which was saying, let's just ignore what they said when they took half a million votes off us. Let's just ignore them when they took 21 seats and let's just double down on our plans. Let's just ask for applause when we try and fix up a mess we keep repeatedly mating. It's not good enough. Presiding officer, presiding officer, Later this afternoon, we're going to have a debate in this parliament on the findings of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform. Made up of MSPs and experts, it took, ex it took evidence on the workings of this place and how we need to improve it. And here's what it said. It said that inaccurate or poor answers damage the reputation of parliament and it damages people's trust in parliament. So if that's the case, in this episode, does the First Minister and our Cabinet not recognise that they are guilty on both counts? Yeah. First Minister. Uh, no, I don't. I've already set out exactly what the position on that is. But if Ruth Davidson really wants to talk about lack of transparency in answers given to a parliament, perhaps she'll go and watch the video of Theresa May in the House of Commons yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Refusing. <laughs> refusing to answer the simple question. 
Did the Secretary of State lobby for Scotland to get the same money that went to Northern Ireland? Yes or no? Perhaps Ruth Davidson will answer it today because the fact of the matter is no amount of camouflage from Ruth Davidson <laughs> will hide this point. No amount of camouflage will hide this point. That while she rides along in her one-trick pony going on and on and on about a referendum, her MPs are selling Scotland down the river. They sold Scotland down the river when it came to £3 billion of extra funding and they sold Scotland down the river when it came to public sector workers. When it comes to Ruth Davidson, it's all mouth and no trousers, camouflage or otherwise. She should be ashamed of herself. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagement with the State of the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. After a decade in charge of Scottish education, the SNP last night voted for unwanted school reforms without any promise of additional money. Policies straight from the 1980s that Margaret Thatcher would have been proud of. It should deeply worry this First Minister that she can only get these reforms through with Tory votes. Yeah. But just before she voted with the Tories last night, the First Minister's Education Secretary, the First Minister's Education Secretary told this Parliament that school funding order, was going please, up. Order. Was he correct to do so, First Minister? First Minister. I think the outturn figures uh, from, for local government spending, uh, if I'm correct in saying this, will show uh, that spending on education has uh, gone up. But uh, Kezia Dugdale uh, talks about uh, the reforms of this government coming without additional uh, funding, and she is just downright wrong about that. And even worse, she knows she is downright wrong about that, because the attainment fund is putting £750 million extra across this parliament uh, into schools and in this very financial year we see £120 million of extra funding going direct to head teachers to allow them to take action to improve attainment in our schools and of course all of this is happening where we see uh, Labour councillors such as those in North Lanarkshire vote to get rid of classroom assistance in our schools. I'm delighted that the First Minister has mentioned the outturn figures. I've got them in my hands here. I've looked at them and, crucially, Spice have looked at them too. So let me tell her the actual numbers. Her own government's figures show this year's spending on education is going down again in real terms. Under the SNP, spending on pupils is going down again in real terms. And I'll tell her just how real it is. The SNP has cut spending by hundreds of pounds on every single pupil. And it's cut spending on each secondary school pupil by over a thousand pounds. It's a 7% cut by this SNP government since 2010. It's not Tory reforms our schools need, it's cold, hard cash. Why can't the First Minister see? Why can't she see that the real problem in our education system is that our schools are skint? First Minister. The problem for Kezia Dugdale is I've got figures in front of me here as well. Uh, data published on the 27th of June shows that councils are planning to spend £144 million more, that's 3% in cash, 1.3% in real terms on education uh, this year than they plan to spend last year and of course that includes uh, the planned spend on the pupil equity fund of 120 million pounds uh, that i spoke about so those uh, presiding officer are the facts this government is taking the tough action to reform our education system to get more powers into the hands of head teachers and teachers and crucially of course to get more resources into the hands of head teachers and teachers. And I note that Kezia Dugdale doesn't want to address the fact that her own council colleagues in parts of Scotland are taking decisions that run directly counter to that. So perhaps Labour should get its own house in order before it comes here to criticise the Scottish Government. Kezia Dugdale.
The problem for the First Minister is that her numbers are just wrong and Spice will confirm that today. The independent Spice will confirm that today. Until the First Minister commits more funding to our schools, yeah. using the powers of this Parliament, yeah. her promise of education being her top priority is utterly meaningless. Yeah. Teacher numbers are down. Support staff numbers are down. Yeah. Class sizes are going up. I have come to this chamber time and time again to tell the First Minister that her government has taken £1 billion from our schools. I was wrong. New figures show us today that it is at least £230 million more than that. It's £1.23 billion taken out of schools on the SNP's watch. Yeah. This week, teachers are going on their summer break. Isn't it the case that what they really need is a break from this government? First Minister. The problem for Kezia Dugdale is that the figures I read out are, are not my figures, they come uh, from uh, councils. They are the council uh, predicted figures and I read them out as they are. But you know, there's a bigger problem. There's a bigger problem for Kezia Dugdale in this exchange, is there not? Because everything she said ignores uh, one important fact. I'm going to point to the council I've already mentioned twice today, North Lanarkshire Council. North Lanarkshire Council, in case people listening to this don't know, is run by Labour, supported by the Tories. Uh -huh. North Lanarkshire runs schools. North Lanarkshire, in its recent budget, decided two things of relevance to this discussion. Firstly, it decided not to use the powers it had been given to increase the council tax. It decided to freeze the council tax. And secondly, it decided to cut the number of classroom assistance, in other words, to sack the very support staff that Kezia Dugdale is talking about. So this government will continue to invest in education, reform education, deliver the changes that our education system needs, and we will do that in spite of Labour councils across the country, not because of them. We have a couple of constituency questions. The first from Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Students at the City of Glasgow College are being charged tuition fees of £420 for a third of a term if a student drops out before the 1st of December of the academic year. It seems to be due to a student awards body rule that it will not fund that. It's passed on to students who are unaware of this obligation until they are pressed with a bill of which they are pursued vigorously by the college as if it were a debt. I appreciate the First Minister will probably be hearing this for the first time, so I apologise for that. But given the apparent unfairness of this, would the First Minister be prepared to look into it to see if it is consistent with a no-fees policy and if it is fair to students who find that they are being pressed as if they were a debt being pursued by a bank or a financial institution when all they've tried to do is go to college and for one reason or another, and we don't know the reasons, have had to drop out and they also lose that year um, that they are studying? First Minister. Uh, well, I'm grateful to Polly McNeill for raising this issue with me. I'm not aware of the detail or, or the circumstances. If she wants to furnish me uh, with that, in fact, whether or not she wants to furnish me with that, I'm happy to give a commitment that we will look into that matter um, and come back to her as soon as we've had the opportunity to do so. Our commitment uh, to uh, the ability of all young people in Scotland to access uh, education without having to pay fees is, a, is I think everybody knows, uh, an absolutely solid one, and I don't want to see anything in Scotland run counter to that. So I'm happy to look into it and come back to the member in due course. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm speaking on behalf of a Syrian family, mother, father, and four siblings granted asylum earlier this year and now residing in my constituency. However, one son has not come to Scotland and is trapped in Lebanon, having moved there to obtain work to provide for that family just before their move. In the process, his asylum application lapsed and now not only trapped in Lebanon, he is trapped in reams of red tape and in a war zone where his life is at risk. The family are distraught and they've already lost one son in the Syrian conflict. I have written earlier this week to the First Minister, but I ask her if she will do what she can to accelerate his reapplication through what is really a labyrinthine process. 
First Minister. Well, I, again, I'm grateful to Christine Graham for uh, writing to me earlier the week, in the week with details of, of this case. I'm certainly very sorry to hear about the plight of this family. I know from my own meetings with refugees from Syria of the great uh, worry and anxiety they face for uh, relatives who remain in Syria and indeed in neighbouring countries. Many local authorities are supporting Syrian refugees in their areas to reunite with family members and I uh, commend the support that they give in this process which can be long and difficult because it involves both uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and Home Office Assessment and all the many logistical arrangements that people have to make. So I hope this family will be reunited soon. I, I do understand that the issue might be that the new registration of refugees in Lebanon by UNHCR has been suspended at the moment at the request of the government of Lebanon. Nevertheless, I will be happy to write to the Home Secretary in support of this family's case and to consider what further action we may be able to take to help this family be re reunited as soon as possible. And Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this week we saw the Royal Navy's largest ever warship, the Queen Elizabeth, leave the dock at Resyth to commence sea trials in the Forth and the North Sea. Will the First Minister join with me in paying tribute to the workforce at Resyth for the completion of this magnificent piece of Scottish engineering and wish them well as they go on to complete the sister ship of the Queen Elizabeth, the Prince of Wales? Uh, yes, I do. I would uh, commend all those uh, at Resize and elsewhere in Scotland who have contributed to the construction of uh, the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, thank them for their efforts and, of course, uh, wish them well as they move on uh, to their next assignment. Uh, so I have no difficulty uh, for once in agreeing with Myrtle Fraser. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet uh, will next meet uh, over uh, the summer. Uh, since 2008, we've met uh, 44 times uh, across the length and breadth of Scotland in 26 different local authority uh, areas. So we intend to get out and about again uh, over the summer recess. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. Presiding officer, after the, the opening exchanges, it's perhaps difficult to remember that once upon a time, the, the last FMQs before summer was a, a moment when all party leaders struggled to find a little consensus and goodwill. So may I offer you and your staff and members on all sides all the best for the summer. But also, I'm astonished, I'm astonished, presiding officer, that they don't even like that at a moment like this. Can I, can I offer, though, the First Minister something constructive to reflect upon over the summer months? The... The child poverty bill is one that should concern us all. And the, the report published today by the Scottish Government indicates that the scale of child poverty in our society is likely to worsen over coming years as a result of tax and welfare changes that we in this parliament no longer have to put up with, no longer have to tolerate. Uh, last week and this week, my colleague Alison Johnson on the committee scrutinising the bill successfully moved amendments to strengthen that legislation, amendments which didn't gain the support of SNP members but did gain the support of all other parties on the committee. Can I ask the First Minister, now that she has a couple of, mo couple of months before that bill reaches its final stage, if she will give a commitment that the government will not seek to reverse those progressive changes that we made to the bill when it reaches stage three after the summer. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I thank Patrick Harvey for his summer greetings, and I would also uh, wish everybody a, a happy and relaxing summer recess. I take no ministerial responsibility for the fact summer appears to have disappeared completely uh, today. Let's hope it uh, reappears. Uh, this is an issue uh, on the child poverty bill and whether the commission uh, that we are going to create will have a statutory underpinning or not that I take a very, very close interest in and have been discussing this matter uh, at length with Angela Constance. Um, I think just to give a little bit of background to this, uh, the concern the government has here, and I should say it is something that we will not only be thinking about over the summer, but looking to discuss with others uh, over the summer. The concern we've got about the amendment uh, was not the statutory underpinning of the commission. I personally have no difficulty whatsoever with a commission uh, being enshrined in statute. Uh, the concern we had, and uh, I think it is a, a concern uh, that has been echoed in some ways by uh, some stakeholders here, is that if that is done uh, in this particular child poverty bill, we restrict potentially the remit of the Commission 
to looking only at child poverty, not at poverty more generally, which is the uh, objective of the Commission. So that's the issue that we are grappling with just now. I very much hope we can find a way forward that recognises the desire for statutory underpinning, but in doing that doesn't unduly restrict the remit of the, the Commission, because I don't think that's something anybody would particularly want to see. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The, the report that I refer to that the government has published today shows very clearly how over the coming years the income particularly of families with children will be hit hardest. We should be bold in ensuring that the legislation we pass is as strong as it possibly can be. I once again urge the First Minister with her colleagues in the Cabinet to consider ret ret retaining and respecting the amendments that have been passed by the committee rather than seeking to reverse them. In particular, one of them calls on the government not even to insist that it exercises, but merely to keep the door open to the option of a top-up to child benefit. And the research is clear that a £5 top-up to child benefit would remove 30,000 children from relative poverty, a 14% reduction. Can the First Minister confirm that the option is open, the door is not being closed, to that policy choice of a top-up to child benefit using the powers that this parliament now has for an objective we should all share, reducing and hopefully eliminating child poverty in Scotland. First Minister. Well, uh, firstly, this uh, bill is uh, bold. It will, when passed, as hopefully it will be passed uh, not long after the summer recess, uh, leave Scotland as the only part of the UK with binding targets to reduce on the way to eliminating child poverty, and I think that's important. Um, we've also already made very clear that uh, one of the uses we will make of new social security powers is to introduce the new early years grant uh, and uh, increase the value of the payments under that, recognising that it's money in the pockets of family that's the most, families that's the most effective way of dealing with uh, child poverty. So I hope we can uh, conclude this bill uh, and come to an outcome where we all agree that we are doing the best things possible. So the door is not closed to anything that's been suggested, but in return, I would uh, make a plea to Patrick Harvey and his colleagues, and indeed to others across the chamber as well, is to engage properly in the substance of this, because as I outlined with the, the issue on the commission, uh, the, some of the issues here are not just that the government is opposing doing something for the sake of opposing doing something, it is that there are real issues in terms of trying to get to an outcome that allows this bill to do the job that it is intended to do and to allow the Poverty Commission that we're going to be establishing to do the job that it is intended to do. So I think with that proper engagement based on uh, a joint shared uh, objective and commitment to not just reducing child poverty but eradicating and eliminating child poverty, we will uh, hopefully be able to get to that outcome. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Last week I asked the First Minister about the latest problems in the police. She told me she had it under control. This week we discovered problems with the Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Authority a botched recruitment process and a flawed forensic service. Is there anything else she hasn't got under control? First Minister. Well, I think, actually, um, seeking to trivialise these issues in the way Willie Rennie is doing there, I don't think does him any great credit, because, because actually that's, that's uh, mischaracterising the answer I gave him uh, last week. What I actually did last week was go into detail about some of the work that had been done, including the report by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, looking at the improvements that had already been made in the workings of the SPA, the relationship between the SPA and its own executive in Police Scotland uh, and the improvements that we were seeing. Uh, this week he refers, amongst other things, to uh, the report on forensics uh, services, and much of that report, of course, talks about the high quality of of forensics services, but it also sets out areas where the SPA requires to deliver further improvement. So uh, we are, uh, and uh, Michael Matheson, of course, is in, lead, in the lead of this work. We are taking the action uh, with the SPA, with Police Scotland, all of that overseen uh, by the inspectorate to make sure that improvements that require to be made uh, are being made. And I think anybody, uh, and I'll give credit to Willie Rennie, because this is an issue or 
police issues generally are ones that he has raised consistently in this chamber and he's right to do so. But I think anybody who has the degree of interest that Willie Rennie has in these issues will, yes, still continue to point to the issues uh, that require to be improved and resolved, but in all fairness would probably also give some credit to the police for the progress, the quite significant progress that they have already made. Willie Rennie. I have to say, that's about as convincing as David Mundell on the Barnet formula. <laughs> it's not just the police, her fingerprints are all over. The Fraser of Allender Institute is warning that we could be 140 hours from recession. The Royal College of Nursing says there are more questions than answers on the NHS workforce plan. And we've just heard Scottish farmers are angry that the First Minister didn't even bother to tell them that they aren't to get their money on time. All of this in just seven days. The First Minister has faced questions on competence on the economy, on education, on policing and on farming. Is that the reason she abandoned a ministerial reshuffle this week? Did she work out that the problem might not be them, but it might be closer to home? First Minister. Proves Willie Rennie actually lives in a wee world of his own most of the time. Sometimes it sounds like quite a fun world, so maybe I'll, I'll join it uh, one day and, uh, and, and take something of whatever, whatever Willie Rennie's on. But anyway, <laughs> turning, to the, turning to the serious issues that he has raised, and I'll try to go through some of them very quickly. Uh, Fraser Allender, important report this morning showing challenges for the Scottish economy. But actually, what the Fraser of Allender report forecasts is that the Scottish economy will grow this year, next year, and the year after. And the big shadow hanging over the performance of the Scottish and the UK economy, of course, is the ongoing Brexit negotiations. Uh, on the issue of NHS workforce planning, uh, the report on workforce planning uh, that was published this week focusing on NHS workforce. There will be further uh, parts of that that focus on how we integrate that with social care and primary care. But that uh, looked at 1,600 more uh, nursing places, adding to the 1,000 we're already committed to over this parliament, as well as other measures to encourage nurses who've perhaps left practice to return to practice. So serious... Uh, substantial comprehensive work looking at how we build on the record numbers of staff in our national health service and make sure that's sustainable for the future on the cap payments issue that i've already uh, talked about at length again you know the fact is for the vast majority of farmers notwithstanding the issues in the system they do have the money uh, that they are 80 percent of the money that they are entitled to so in all of these issues uh, whether it's uh, in the last week or over the recess or after the recess, this is a government that will get on with delivering for the people of Scotland, get on with it, doing the job that we are here to do, improving our public services, helping to grow our economy and lift people out of poverty. And we'll let the others uh, continue with our bad jokes in Willie Rennie's case and the uh, political point scoring in the others. We'll get on with the job. Anna, this time there's a few more supplementaries. The first from Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The F Prime Minister yesterday repeatedly failed to confirm whether David Mundell made representations over Scotland receiving its fair share in funding following the Tory DUP deal. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's now obvious he made no such effort? First Minister. Well, I think it's obvious to anybody that David Mundell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, did not lift a finger to try to make sure that Scotland got additional funding in the same way that Northern Ireland got additional funding. And if the normal rules had been applied here, Scotland would be looking at additional funding of almost three billion pounds. But thanks to uh, David Mundell not lifting a finger, thanks to these 13 Tory MPs that just a couple of weeks ago we were getting told we're going to be ruling the roost in number 10 and in London. Instead they've gone AWOL and Scotland hasn't got a single penny. Shame on the Scottish Conservatives and shame on the Secretary of State for Scotland. When you know I was watching him uh, yesterday trying to wriggle his way out of the fact that just a few days ago he was saying he would never stand for something that gave money by the back door to Northern Ireland. It seems that when he was asked what he did to stand up for Scotland, the answer was simply this. When the Tories 
came to shaft and sell out Scotland, all David Mundell did was try to make sure they did it transparently. I think people have got the right to expect a lot more from the so-called Secretary of State for Scotland. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Scotland is in the height of its uh, LGBT pride season. Uh, would the First Minister agree with me that is, it is unacceptable for schools to deny young people the right to express their identity or support the LGBTI community? First Minister. Uh, yes, I believe all uh, young people should be able to express uh, their identity freely without fear of uh, discrimination or bullying in any way and I don't think schools or any other part of society should prevent them uh, from doing that. Uh, I would congratulate the Thai campaign in particular for uh, reaching its, uh, I think its second anniversary uh, this week. Uh, we are currently working with Thai uh, in the working group that has been set up to promote an inclusive approach to sex and relationship education in our schools and we uh, look forward to continuing uh, work to progress that through this working group in the weeks and months to come. And Alec Rowley. President officer, I want to return to the issue of the Child Poverty Act. Um, I understand what the, minister, what the First Minister says about the Commission and Labour will work with the government over the summer to try and find a way forward. But can I ask the First Minister what work is being done to identify the costs of addressing child poverty? And does she accept that unless we actually make new monies available to invest to tackle child poverty, then targets will not be met? First Minister. Well, firstly, I welcome Alec Rowley's uh, commitment to work with us. And I think uh, from my conversations with Angela Constance, I think he does understand the issue here in terms of uh, the statutory underpinning of the Commission. That's not the problem. The issue is, do we want to restrict the Commission to just child poverty as opposed to poverty more generally? And I think there is a view on the part of some stakeholders that we shouldn't do that. But I'm uh, certainly keen that we work with others to find the right way forward on that. Two further points I would make uh, would be this one. Yes, I agree that we have to invest uh, to lift people out of poverty. That's why, as we take on our new social security powers, this government uh, is looking to do exactly that. I mentioned the Early Years Grant earlier on, uh, and the, the money we already spent, uh, the tens uh, of millions of pounds every single year right now that we spend mitigating some of the welfare cuts that if we weren't doing that would be hitting families and children much harder than they already are. Uh, but the third and last point I would make is this. Uh, that notwithstanding how welcome the additional social security powers uh, are, the vast bulk of the budget around social security will remain in the hands of Westminster. And as long as we allow that to be the case, we're going to be at the mercy of a Tory government that is intent on ripping up uh, the social security safety net. And I think that is why all of us who care about these things, and I include everybody in this chamber uh, in that, all of us who care about these things should be arguing for, campaigning for and demanding to have more social security powers in the hands of this parliament so that we can use them to lift people out of poverty, not drive more people into it. Yeah. Question number five, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to close the gender pay gap. First Minister. Uh, we are... Uh, transforming uh, early learning and childcare uh, to support more women back into work. We're taking measures to challenge pregnancy and maternity discrimination. We're encouraging employers to pay the real living wage, which uh, particularly will benefit women. And we're funding returners programmes to help women update their skills after a career break. Uh, statistics show that progress is being made in reducing the gender pay gap in Scotland. It's currently 15.6%, which is down from uh, over 20% in 2007. But we know that there is much more still to do, uh, which is why we're taking the action that I've already outlined. John Mason. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that reply. She may know that the Economy Committee this week published its report on the gender pay gap, and there's a lot of interesting information in that. One of the things we found is that in, a, say, professions like law and accountancy, uh, there's now good numbers of women coming into these professions, but they're not getting into senior positions. Does she think it's just a matter of time for that to change, or should people be taking positive action to get more women into senior positions? First Minister. Uh, well, I am a believer in positive action. Um, I, I don't think we would have made the progress uh, in politics, for example, that we have made, although there's still a lot of progress uh, yet to be made, but I don't think we'd have made the progress we have 
uh, unless there had been positive action schemes, uh, not by all parties in this chamber, but by some parties in this chamber. And I think if you look around uh, the gender balance across the different groups in this parliament, you will see the evidence uh, that positive action works. And frankly, you'll see some evidence uh, of where positive action might uh, actually come in uh, very well in improving uh, gender balance. Uh, so I believe in positive action, but I also think it's important we take action across uh, a range of uh, different areas. That's why the uh, Partnership for Change 50-50 uh, uh, by 2020 campaign is so important and we've already got a lot of big private sector organisations uh, signed up to that. And it's also about culture and it's about working practices, it's about all of these things, but we've got to all of us uh, dedicate ourselves uh, to this simple uh, belief and principle that if we had uh, a society in, way in which everybody was just able to get on on the basis of merit, we'd have 50-50 between men and women across all areas of our society already. Uh, it's because there is systemic barriers to women that we don't. Uh, and if we're going to overcome those systemic barriers, then we've got to take action in the range of ways that I've already spoken about. Gordon Lindhurst. The Economy Committee also heard evidence that in some areas men suffer from a gender pay gap in relation to women. Now, while this may be less of a problem than that affecting women, what steps is the Scottish Government taking to ensure a balanced approach which addresses the issue where it does affect men? First Minister. Yeah. I, I, I think it makes the point, doesn't it? I think currently Ruth Davidson is slowly sliding <laughs> under that desk <laughs> in front of her right now. Look, the, the whole essence of equality is that men and women are treated equally. So yes, in, in, in the spirit of consensus, I, I kind of accept the underlying premise of the question. But anybody who can look at the problem of uh, the gender pay gap right now or the in gender inequalities that exist in other parts of our society and conclude that the problem is we've got to do more to help men rather than women, I think kind of misses the whole point here and probably just underlines the fact that the Tories have got an awful lot to do here. I looked, uh, I looked at the detail of the, uh, the shadow cabinet reshuffle that happened uh, yesterday and I, I may... I may not be getting this, uh, the, the figures absolutely right here, but around something like 30 appointments, there were only five women in that. That's shocking. And I think rather than come up with convoluted questions like that, the Tories really need to go away and take a long, hard look at themselves when it comes to gender balance. And question six, Finlay Carson. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will meet the 30th of June deadline for the processing of 2016 CAP payments. First Minister. Well, as I have outlined uh, already today, we are doing all that we can to make the vast majority of Pillar 1 payments uh, by the 30th of June deadline. Uh, we are making daily progress in that. Uh, as at Friday the 16th of June, which is less than two weeks ago, we'd made 58% uh, of the value of all payments by last Friday that had risen to 76% by last night indeed this morning uh, that was at 82% uh, which is a total of £346 million paid out so rapid progress is being made on a daily basis and we will continue to make that progress. Finlay Carson. Thank you for that answer I was, I was actually hoping for a yes or no answer but that's maybe too much to ask for. Rural Scotland has lost all faith in this government they've let down farmers yeah. let down crofters and let down rural businesses the length and breadth of this country. This fiasco must come to an end. It's beginning to resemble a poor movie sequel. Last year we had payment fiasco one. This year we've had payment fiasco two. Next year, are we going to have Nicola Sturgeon and Fergus Ewing playing the baddies once again in the sequel payment fiasco three? <laughs> right now, right here, Will the First Minister give rural communities and this Parliament a guarantee that her government will learn from the shambles of the last two years and that farmers will be paid in full and on time in next year's round of CAP payments? First Minister. Well, let me tell the member what a fiasco is. A fiasco is a Secretary of State for Scotland that forgets to stand up for Scotland. A fiasco. 
A fiasco is a government that can't even manage competently to deliver the Brexit that they're so recklessly leading the country into. This government will continue to deliver for farmers and for others across Scotland. But let me say, in this week, one thing is beyond any doubt whatsoever. The Scottish Conservatives have let down everyone in Scotland. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a debate on the Commission on Parliamentary Reforms report 